Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Power of Giving event. And this is an event designed to just celebrate the impact that private philanthropy has at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And so I'm Steve Evans, the Executive Director of Advancement for the College. And I'll be have the pleasure of introducing your speakers this morning and kind of walking through everything with you for the next 45 minutes or so. And uh, first and foremost, just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us, not only for your time, but everyone on this call supports the college in a variety of different ways through your time, through your involvement, and through your philanthropy. And, you know, the experiences of our students are made better by your sacrifices and your gifts every day. And we just want to say thank you for your support. And hopefully you'll learn a little bit about how you can impact future students through philanthropy as well. And I wanted to introduce our first speaker, Dean Dave Richardson, who's been the Dean of the college effectively since 2014. And uh, Dean, during his tenure here, Dean Richardson has a variety of accomplishments. Uh, significant among them is the creation and establishment of the Beyond 120 program, which helps, helps students to go beyond the 120 credit hours it takes to graduate, while also providing experiential learning opportunities that help students to launch out into successful careers after graduation. He's helped to grow the college in a variety of different ways and also provided outstanding leadership during the past year as we've endured and thrived in the COVID-19 pandemic. And without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dean Richardson. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, event this morning. Uh, I'm going to play a very small role here at the beginning with just some remarks and uh, talk a bit about where the university is right now and then do a bit of a historical review so, we're, so that we can uh, kind of put ourselves in context here as an institution, as a college uh, for now looking forward, uh, which is, by the way, the viewpoint of our students. We have to keep this in mind. Their viewpoint when they come to the University of Florida, when they join our college, when they pursue a degree uh, in our college is very much, what does the future hold? And so that is the theme uh, that, that uh, I started with as a dean in 2014. Uh, we are a student focused college first and foremost. Everything we do has to uh, engage and involve our students' best interests uh, as they uh, work through our college and the next four years are also important uh, as they get their feet on the ground in their career, wherever that might be. <clears throat> so this has been, uh, needless to say, a challenging year for many. Uh, I, I am uh, thankful that so many of us have uh, prevailed here, but I'm also aware that there have been losses uh, and this may have happened to some of your families. And I certainly offer you my condolences <clears throat> uh, uh, here today. Uh, one thing that we've kind of gotten used to is the Zoom uh, environment that we're in right now. So I wanted to do something just a little bit different and actually use the Zoom environment for, for good. And so I'm going to move up here like this and say that I'm coming to you today from beautiful Gainesville, Florida. And this is the look looking out the window of the Dean's office on the second floor of Turlington Hall. You can sort of make it out, but uh, you can't really see too well, but right at the bottom of the frame, right in the middle, that's Turlington Rock, which sits out on Turlington Plaza and Century Tower is back over, over there. And then just to give you a little tour, here's the inside of my office as we come around and then we come back. So who says that Zoom can't be exciting and educational? All right. <clears throat> so um, I want to begin by, by acknowledging that this has been a tough year for a lot of our students and faculty, uh, but our staff as well. And foremost, we want to be sure that uh, as we work with our students uh, through a difficult year in many of their lives, that they have the uh, resources it needs to to get through, to be successful and prevail. And that's where the Class Cares Fund came from. Uh, we put together this fund to help those who are in need, uh, who just need a little boost in order to get past the, the barrier to success 
or uh, their own study, whether it's in their studies or in uh, other parts of their lives uh, so that they can uh, be successful here at UF. And so we very much appreciate what you have put in and uh, what all of our alumni who have, who have contributed have done uh, for these, these students and their needs. I also wanna just mention because we are talking about plan giving that plan giving is extraordinarily important to a college like ours. These are gifts, if given now, are not going to be, uh, be uh, uh, having an impact until some future dean and some future faculty and some future student body is here. And I can tell you that having been the beneficiary at this time in uh, the college's history, of many planned gifts over the last few years, these have an incredible uh, uh, impact on our college and are extraordinarily welcome. So don't think that the impact has to be right now here today in order to be meaningful. It certainly does not. <clears throat> so I want to uh, take a moment here and do a little history, as I said. You know, back in the 1970s, uh, if you came to UF, you were part of, potentially, you were going to go through what was called the University College, which was a, a uh, basically the freshman, sophomore college where all the classes that were involved in general education of all the students at the university took place. After completing those introductory courses, uh, which were specifically designed for freshmen, uh, the uh, choice of a major was the next stop on the educational pathway to graduation. That initial year, year plus of classes, often called C courses, were uh, hugely influential to our freshmen at that time. They all came in as a cohort, they all took the same classes, and they, they did things in those courses which they never saw in high school. I'll give you a great example, philosophy ethics and philosophy, not something typically taught in high schools, but that was taught in the C courses. And as a result, many of our alumni, even today who went through that period in our history as a university, reflect back on that as a time when they realized that college could be so much more than they expected and uh, how meaningful that exposure to principles of philosophy and ethics uh, were to them in their lives. And so that changed, however, uh, during my time, I came to UF in the 80s. And over that period of 30 plus years, what has happened has been a huge shift in the way the finances of the university work in its relationship with the state and in the way education works in general in this country. One of those was an agreement between the university and the legislature in the 90s that uh, students, if they came in and declared a major, would be expected to get the classes that they needed to finish in four years. This would bring down the time to graduation. And this kind of mutual agreement between students and the university meant that their progress could be predictable and regular. And thus, decreasing the uh, time to graduation. Uh, that's the first impact, which spelled a change in freshman education. And then secondly, the development of uh, various kinds of college credit programs, dual enrollment, AP, IB programs, and the like, became acceptable and, high, and accepted ways of getting college credit before even setting foot at UF. So eventually, by the time we got to the end of the 1990s, most of the students who came to UF uh, had significant amounts of college credit, significant amounts. Sometimes they started as sophomores, and so, and even almost juniors in some cases. And so our freshman class became highly fragmented in terms of their educational needs. They had already met some of the requirements of general education. So the idea of doing something in a first year experience like a C course back in the 70s 
became a, a kind of a distant memory at that point. There was another impact going on uh, as we came into the 2000s, and that was a distinct change in our society and the relationship of uh, uh, teenagers uh, who were defined as 16 to 19 years old in the census and by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, where, wherein their prospects were be, being employed uh, while in that age group were declining precipitously. So we went from a typical scenario where over two thirds of the individuals uh, in the 16 to 19 year old group worked to one in which about 25% at most worked uh, by the time I took over as dean in 2014. And so this was accompanied by a change in the work experience levels of students coming to starting in college as, as freshmen. So these students came to college with incredible preparation academically, very high aspirations for the experiences that they wanted to have in college, but the university uh, and more specifically, our college were not really living up to the expectations as we tried to adjust to this new kind of student who came in very advanced in terms of uh, their backgrounds in academics, but far less advanced in their experiences in the workplace, for example. And so uh, as a result, we thought about what we would start doing in 2014 and 15 and came up with the experiential education program beyond 120 that Steve talked about. Uh, we are very proud of the progress that has been made there. Hundreds and hundreds of freshmen uh, have been served. We've had over 1,600 freshmen participate in Beyond 120 programs over the last three years. And the impact that this program has on them uh, has been significant. Uh, we are continually trying to expand uh, Beyond 120. And we've been very fortunate to have many folks uh, support the program uh, with their uh, with their gifts of time and uh, uh, funding. So thank you to all of you who may have contributed uh, to that. So where does that leave us now? Are we done? No, we're not. Because really what we've lost from the university C course era is this idea of the freshman experience, the freshman cohort. And this requires us to think differently from the way that uh, uh, things were back in the 60s and 70s, obviously. Our students are coming in in a different way. So this, is, this began in earnest a few years ago when we began the Quest program uh, at the University of Florida. And we are to date the largest participant in the Quest program in terms of teaching and instruction overall. Quest program, really starts the process of building a freshman experience that is special for, for uh, new students so that they learn that college is clearly and distinctively different from what they knew as education before uh, they arrived at UF. And uh, I, I hope that you will take a moment and learn more about the Quest program by just going to the UF website and Googling Quest. Uh, what are we going to do in our college to further this? Well, I just will touch on this very, very briefly. Uh, we think that the curriculum needs to be examined more closely for our incoming students in particular, but also for our transfer students when they come here uh, after uh, completing their associate's degrees. The curriculum uh, has many components in it right now that are extremely powerful and helpful for students' careers, writing, speaking, presentations, and throw in then the experiential education, internships, undergraduate research, study abroad. Those things are in our programs. Beyond 120 has taken up the second group. It has taken up those outside experiences, but the curriculum side of these important skills that our students must learn in order to be as successful as they can possibly be when they leave us, whatever they do, uh, have been somewhat fragmented. And I think that this is just, just a natural consequence of the different uh, preparation that our students have uh, when they come to UF. 
we need to assure that every student has an op opportunity as part of their learning process at UF and our curricular uh, op opportunities for them to learn to write well, learn to speak well, and very importantly in today's world, communicate uh, uh, forcefully with facts, to speak from a knowledge of data and the understanding of how important it is to create um, create knowledge uh, that will then transfer to others, whether it's through writing, through speaking, uh, or, through, or through other forms of engagement, like, like, like we're doing right here today. So I will end uh, my remarks with that and just simply say that the future of liberal arts and sciences at UF is something that I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, you're going to uh, hear some uh, fantastic people today, and I don't want to take any more time. Thank you very, very much for being here. And uh, Steve, back to you. Thank you, Dean. And I'm going to hand it off briefly to Paris Saxena, who is one of our Associate Directors of Development in the college. And he's going to have a couple pieces of audience participation for us today. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to have uh, a little bit of a breakup from our speakers throughout uh, the presentation today, uh, leading off with me, but we're going to have some trivia. Uh, so I'll give you the trivia question here in a moment, but please continue uh, and, and put your guesses to this trivia in the chat. Uh, we will have prizes. Um, we are playing price of, uh, price of right rules. So if you do guess too high, Unfortunately, your, your answer will not count. Um, and so as you can see on the screen, the first question that we are going to start off with today is how many faculty members are currently in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences? Uh, please do not Google. I know we're all on Zoom. We're going to use the honor system here, but if you wanna place your answers in the chat, uh, we will monitor that and uh, kind of continue on from there. Play along as well, if you want as well. The answers, please keep them coming. Nope. Right. I think we are going to wrap it up there. Thank you guys for uh, all of your participation. Um, it looks like Mr. Rosenthal was the closest and uh, congratulations. The answer was 803. So uh, congratulations, Mr. Rosenthal. You will be getting a prize here shortly. Uh, if you didn't get it on that round, we will have a couple more opportunities uh, throughout the presentation. Um, but thank you all for playing this round and we'll see you on the next one. Steve, back to you. All right, thanks, Paris. And next, I wanted to introduce Joan Forrest, who is the uh, chair of the Dean's Leadership Council. And Joan has recently retired from her role as CEO of the Dawson Academy, which is a postgraduate educational and clinical research company dedicated to the advancement of dentistry. And Joan is really an expert on leadership development and leadership training and has lectured nationally and internationally and uh, started a company called Prime Performance earlier in her career as well that specialized in that also. So uh, Joan, thank you for being with us today and uh, for coming to have a conversation about your philanthropy with the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the University of Florida. I'm really happy to be here, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to, to start off, could you just tell us, you know, very broadly, what inspired you to make your first gift to UF and what inspired you to kind of get involved with the college and, and start giving back? 
Sure. You know, I had to really um, do a little research and rack my brain because I wasn't sure when my first uh, <clears throat> gift occurred, but it was actually 35 years ago, um, nine years after I graduated from undergrad school. And it was uh, the huge amount of $20, <clears throat> which was probably all I had at the time. And um, I think that the the um, initiating event was a phone call from a student and when they do the phone-a-thon calls. And <clears throat> so that was my first gift. And then uh, the subsequent year, the next year, I uh, gave a gift to the college, not just to the university foundation. I think that might've been up to about $45. Um, but uh, the interesting thing was as I became involved and then started re receiving information, uh, magazines about the university and ha having been gone for a while, but getting reconnected and seeing what was going on, it just reignited my passion and also um, my gratefulness for what the university did for me. And it's just continued on since then. Outstanding, outstanding. And as, as your relationship with the college progressed uh, a few years later, you took a big leap and you made a multi-year commitment to the Bob Graham Center for Public Service. And so uh, tell us about, you know, what, what prompted you to make that leap and that level of faith in the college and, you know, what, what sort of inspired that gift? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, I felt like my career, which it had grown considerably since I gave my $20 contribution, um, by that time uh, was so much the result of the leadership opportunities that I had when I was at school and undergrad. And um, so many times different uh, members of the development office would stop by my office in St. Pete and visit and just bring me up to date on what was going on at the school. And um, I, I was doing an annual gift at that time. And in the course of just really friendly conversations, they became aware of my passion for um, leadership and leadership development. And uh, one day, I think it was Cody, who was Ryan before Ryan, uh, told me about this. If I had this passion, I could create something that supported that. And that's how the multi-year uh, program came about and the best place to support future student leader, future leaders who were students was through the Bob Graham Center. And um, so they helped me set that up. And uh, I don't know how many years that's been going now, but it's very rewarding to see the caliber of students we have uh, at the university now and the leadership skills that they have. They're unbelievable. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Gosh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And Joan, uh, I know a little bit after that, your relationship continued to grow and, and you kind of saw the impact of your gifts and, and saw that same leadership you know, the same leadership opportunities being uh, exposed to others. And you made a, a really big commitment and you decided to include the college in your state plans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a very unique type of gift. I think it's a very special type of gift for any donor to make. And when we wanted to focus on a little bit today, you know, what, what made you think about first including the university and the college in your estate plans? And, and what, how did you go about making that decision? It, it was, um, wasn't something that I had really given a lot of thought to. I didn't think that I qualified. I didn't think I was uh, in that stratosphere um, to be able to do something like that. And um, various times the development officer that would come to visit me, which by now was Brian and also a fellow named Alex, uh, a, a estate planning attorney. Um, and we'd be talking about things and they happened to mention planned giving and left a brochure. And I realized uh, what well, took a couple of meetings because at first I thought, well, how do I know how much money I'm gonna have when I die? And how do I figure that out? And, and uh, what if I run out of money before I die? Things like that. And um, I, I don't come from a family that had significant wealth and I didn't have any experience in seeing how it was done. Um, but with great guidance from the university, they helped me understand that I could allocate a percentage of my estate to the university, which also has some great tax benefits. And um, we, uh, 
talk through that. They put me in touch with another person in the development foundation office to explain more about that. And it was really very simple. And what amazed me was that the university recognizes that gift now based on um, what my net worth is now and what does that percentage come out to be. So it's very, very rewarding to be able to do something like that, honestly, while you're still alive and, and know that at some point in the future, uh, students are gonna really benefit. My favorite quote is from Kierkegaard. It says, life is best learned backwards, but unfortunately live forwards. And I think about, you know, okay, I can give my backwards history here and my backwards resources to the future by doing planned giving. So um, I would just encourage anybody that, you know, either you know a lot about it or you don't, just to ask because the team, and by now it was Ryan, uh, Cody had moved on to the agriculture school and Ryan Marsh and I had many conversations and um, a few others and everybody I've met in connection with the development office is um, is in informative. Um, no one ever asked me for money. They just helped me see the possibilities and helped me see what was going on at the university. And again, I contribute my um, success in my career and becoming a business owner and an entrepreneur to the University of Florida. And I just want to give back to that. Absolutely. I, lo I love that quote as well. And so thank you for, for sharing that experience. And you, you touched on this a little bit, but for, you know, just in case there's other thoughts or, or pieces of wisdom you have for alums who might be considering making a plain gift as well. Maybe they've read on the website, maybe they've gotten a, a brochure like the one our team left with you. Uh, what advice would you have for those alums who are maybe thinking about making a planned gift, but haven't quite made that decision yet? Well, yeah, I would just say, you know, don't feel pressured at all. Know that there's a group of people at the school that um, are willing to just share information with you and let you know what the options are. And they really want to make sure that it works for you and your family as well as the university. So they're not going to steer you down any wrong path um, or push you into anything in any way at, at all. It's, it's, um, it's an enlightening process. In fact, since that time, I've also added a school, a private school in St. Petersburg that my son went to um, in my plan giving as well. So um, it's, it, it's just a conversation and you might find it enlightening. You might find that it works well for you. And if it does, it'll be a wonderful thing for the university. But I also want to mention it doesn't replace whatever you're doing annual giving now. And I, I still do both. So I've got the, you know, I allocate some money every year from my budget to the school because it's important to me and then also have the planned gift, so. Well, Jen, thank you again. And, and this is kind of our, our final question for this segment, but as, as the chair of the Dean's Leadership Council, as an important leader for the college, you know, what makes you most proud of the college and what are you most excited about for the college's future? Wow, well, I am actually, I'm most proud of being an alum because the students that we have there today make us look really good. Um, they're so smart, so passionate about the future, about their careers, about the country, about the environment, whatever it is that these individual students are passionate about, they are full force impressive and I just love when I'm able to come up to campus and interact with them. Um, I come away just so amazed every time that uh, the caliber of students that are there. So I'm, I'm most proud to be able to call myself an alum and I tell them all that they make me look really good from way back in the 70s. I'm most excited about the vision that Dean Richardson has created. The Beyond 120 program I think is absolutely brilliant. Uh, when I first heard about it, it touched my heart because as I said, my success in my career was not just from the academics that I had at the university, but from the leadership opportunities and the experiences that I had with various um, administrators on campus. And Beyond 120 is giving students that opportunity. And I think that Florida is at the forefront, especially the college of understanding that it's not just book learning today that's gonna to make students successful. So beyond 120 and now adding this new vision 
of having every student be able to communicate verbally, making a presentation in writing. Uh, as a former employer, I just retired in January. I can tell you the writing skills out there are horrible. And um, I'm very excited that the university has taken a step to make sure that University of Florida grads don't have horrible writing. So there's tremendous things um, in the future. I'll just throw in there that my son uh, went, went to the University of Florida. He graduated in 02, uh, excuse me, 06, and got his master's in 08. And he's doing incredibly well. And I have four grandchildren now, so I'm pumping it. I got go Gators, get them going. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joan. And, and like you said, go Gators. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Albert, Albert Coker now, who's one of our Associate Directors of Development for our next Trivia Spotlight, so. All right, good morning, everybody. So trivia question number two is, how many countries are home to class alumni? So go ahead and think about it for a second and then just post your answers in the chat. Same rules apply as the, uh, the last question as well. be the winner. I know the answer. So. <laughs> I keep, I keep waiting for have... someone to put one dollar in there. And <laughs> no, price, I, I'll because right. I know the answer. <laughs> All right. So looks like the person that came the closest is Mr. Tom Elegant. Um, the actual answer is 95. So we have class alumni living in 95 different countries. Um, and another interesting fact for you, um, currently we have a, over 127,000 living alumni. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of us out there and if you needed proof that the Gator Nation is, is all over, look no further than, you know, our class alumni living in other countries. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you, Albert. And uh, for our next speaker, I wanted to introduce Dr. Kelly Roberts, who's the director of the William and Grace Dial Center for Written and Oral Communication. And the Dial Center for more than 25 years now has served students all across the university by providing interdisciplinary education programs that teach students to be effective communicators. It's also home to our award-winning and nationally renowned speech and debate program. And as you've heard, you know, a lot about the college's future vision for written and oral communication and helping students to grow in that space. Obviously, the Dial Center has a key role in that. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll give you Dr. Kelly Roberts. Thank you so much, Steve. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you today, and I am thrilled to introduce you to one of the many successful programs in UF's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. As we celebrate our silver anniversary, the William and Grace Dial Center for Written and Oral Communication continues to uphold its mission and its vision to improve the communication skills of UF students and beyond. With that said, I am not an expert in state planning or sustaining gifts, but I have experienced the power and the impact of gift giving in the lives of our students and faculty through the generosity extended to the Dial Center and the UF Speech and Debate team. When the Dial Center's doors opened back in 1996, our benefactor, Joan Raffier, offered a profound revelation embodied in her memories of her father, Billy Dial, and her dreams for our ultimate success as a center with long lasting and significant impact for the university and the world. My father was a good communicator, she explained. He was a marvelous speaker 
and he wrote well. So this gift to the Center for Written and Oral Communication seemed like something very suitable for him, especially because it transcends all disciplines. So today, allow me to tell you about how the Dial family gift has profoundly impacted two special areas in very special ways, our faculty and our programs. Communication is the study of human interaction and expression where we aim to equip students with skills in speaking, writing, critical thinking, use of evolving technology, and productive interaction with other people. These are skills that help students make informed decisions, keep interpersonal relationships alive, and make them more assertive and confident. They obtain these values and skills via experiential learning and coursework. With 33 majors requiring our popular introduction to public speaking course, the Dial Center taught over 3,000 undergraduate students this past year, even via Zoom. We also offered a full slate of upper division courses for students in our communication studies minor, including things like intercultural communication, communication and civic engagement, conflict management and negotiation in the professions, family communication, and much more. We have a, com a communication studies internship. Do let me know if you might like a Gator communicator intern for your organization. Our interdisciplinary role connects faculty across campus and the community as they share the importance that communication plays in personal and career success through workshops and communication consultations. Additionally, the Dial Endowment helps them and our students travel to professional conferences nationally and internationally to present their research and take advantage of professional development opportunities. I could certainly go on about how private giving has impacted our Dial Center faculty in their efforts both to teach and to progress our discipline. But I also want to share how our students and their experiential learning has been impacted. The Dial Center Ambassador Leadership Program is a constant bright spot for us. These 20 or so students serve as the first face for the Dial Center. Ever touting our program and our faculty, they revamped our Communication Studies Biannual Minors Fair this year into a fully online event with over 100 attendees. These student leaders also host our graduation courting event ceremony. We thought this was a nice event where our graduating minors receive the cords that they wear with their regalia when they walk across the stage at graduation. But we didn't really understand the true impact until our 2019 courting ceremony and reception, where we had 30 graduating seniors accompanied by family and friends, including a 97-year-old grandmother, though we were unable to understand anything she said in Italian, her nonverbal communication was loud and clear. She was proud to witness her granddaughter's academic acknowledgments. The Dial Center's public speaking lab with equipment purchased from private gifts normally finds students working on speeches, rehearsing their presentations, and receiving immediate feedback. When the lab was forced online this year, the services provided by our undergraduate speech consultants and our graduate teaching assistants were still in great demand. We had over 200 visits via Zoom this past spring semester. There, the students found that scheduling was a little bit easier, private online appointments more appealing, and practicing a speech in a Zoom meeting just a little less anxiety producing. As we head into the fall semester, we plan to have both face-to-face -face and online lab hours available. Finally, the University of Florida speech and debate team has been in the national spotlight for their competitive success and representation of the university for the past 90 years. Students from a variety of majors, from physics to political science, to engineering, to English, and alums such as George Smathers and Bob Graham, who both competed back in the day, benefit from the oratory, critical thinking, research, organizational, and teamwork skills they learn during their time on the team. 
The competitive speech and debate squads travel nationally, and they come home with lots of trophies and bragging rights as they consistently rank among the 25 top teams in the nation. Along with support from our alumni who help with coaching, judging, and financial support for travel, we have two scholarship funds. One named after former debate coach, Dallas Dickey. Yes, Doug Dickey's father was also a coach at the University of Florida. And Doug still fondly remembers watching from the sidelines, so to speak, as his dad coached his debaters to victory. We also have another scholarship named after a long ago professor, Professor A.A. A. Hopkins. And that was started by one of his former students, Colonel Robert Ely, who competed in the 1940s. These have a way to go before reaching the level of our rivals like that of the University of Alabama or the University of Texas at Austin. But even without scholarships, the university team consistently has students in the elimination rounds of major tournaments, national finalists, and All-Americans. The team's 2019-2020 season ended abruptly with travel banned and tournaments canceled. And this past year with online competition has been a very different year for an activity that focuses on face-to-face -face communication. Our public debate squad, however, thrived. They had well attended online debates on topics such as the US government's response to COVID-19 and the removal of SAT requirements for college admission. Competition and public debates provide our students with the opportunity to enhance their research and communication skills. And this year, their flexibility. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of those students. Saad Masood is a 2021 graduate with degrees in English and biology. He holds the 2019 state title in persuasive speaking, was a national finalist in after dinner speaking, and in 2020, he brought home not one, but five state championship titles. Here he is to tell you about the impact that speech and debate played on his UF journey and what comes next. Saad. Hi everyone, good morning. And as Kelly said, I am a 2021 graduate, meaning I just graduated about two weeks ago now. And I am very fortunate to have uh, begun working already. I'm a part of my gap year, in which I have opted to work as a medical scribe in the emergency department here in my hometown of Boca Raton. And traditionally, what a scribe does is predominantly storytelling. I tell patient stories as they're admitted till the moment that they're discharged. And that's something that I've developed being a member of the UF speech and debate team. Having my degrees in biology and English wasn't a decision that I made coming into UF. It was also something that I had decided in my junior year after well having been well over three years into my speech and debate journey. Because at that point, I realized how interdisciplinary academics and science and arts tend to be, similar to what we see in the naming of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Being a member of both of these different spheres of thinking has allowed me to excel in both communication and to promote my goals of being a physician in the future. In fact, US speech and debate team was the first organization that I joined as I set foot on campus. I learned about them during preview and it was a decision that I never looked back upon. I was happy to be able to travel along with my teammates across the country and across Florida. And now they're my closest friends too. I saw people give speeches about social issues domestically and international issues as they talked about issues that they cared about most. I talked about scientific issues that I even mentioned right now in my different interviews for medical school and in my personal statement. I'm excited to see where the team goes in the future. And even in 2020 and 2021, I opted to serve as a coach and help students navigate these unknown waters of virtual competition. And I was amazed to see that the progress that they've made despite having all these different obstacles. I'm sure that in the future, 
uh, members of the US speech and debate team are going to go on to do amazing things because they prove that knowledge doesn't exist in a vacuum. Having the knowledge to be able to apply what you learn in the classroom is just as important as the things that we take away from our academics. And aside from academics, I definitely have to say that I've learned an immense amount from traveling and listening to other people in the circuit. And I'm excited to see where I can apply my own knowledge moving forward. Today, the Dial Center continues to affect change in the lives of UF students. The impact of working together with UF alumni like Joan Raffier and with planned gifts like that of former UF debater and Florida leader, Terrell Sessoms, the Dial Center and the UF speech and debate team will continue to offer students the benefits that come from our academics and experiential learning while making us all proud to be Florida Gators. Thank you so much, Kelly and Assad. Thank you for your time, for your words as well. And I think we're all just excited to see what the future holds for you and, and certainly proud of the experiences you've had thus far as a Gator. So, and congratulations on graduation. So, and for our final speaker today, uh, now I wanted to introduce briefly uh, Rachel Dorman. And Rachel is our Associate Director of Gift Planning for the UF Foundation and Rachel, partner specifically with the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And so she's an important member of our team and really specializes in uh, estate and gift planning. And she's gonna share with you some information uh, about different types of gifts and different ways that you might be able to give back to the university that you may not have considered before. So, Rachel. Hi, and thank you so much for having me. Um, as Steve shared, my name is Rachel Dorman. I'm an Associate Director of Estate and Gift Planning here at the University of Florida, and I help provide support to the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts and Sciences whenever we have donors who are interested in giving to the college through their estate plans or through any type of asset that's more complicated than just direct cash giving. Um, and if we progress to the next slide, I would like to briefly share with you all an overview of our team. Um, our team is comprised of 11 individuals and I just want you all to be aware of who these people are and have a name to face in the future. I know some of you all live in different parts of the country or um, also have relationships with other fundraisers, but at the very top row um, is our six gift planners. And in fact, one of them are on this call, Andrea Foreman. Um, and we each help provide support to different colleges and units across campus. And in fact, we're each assigned regions across the US so that we provide full coverage across the United States. Um, we also have one in-house real estate expert, Fred Rowe, who assists us with gifts of real estate. We have four talented and amazing support staff. Um, if we could progress to the next slide. I, one of the key things about our jobs is that we like to help share the good news of gift planning. So first, I want to share some of the broad reasons why gift planning is important to nonprofits. Um, gift planning is really the intersection between charitable giving and estate planning. Um, and research has found that over 33% of adults actually have good intentions of wanting to make a charitable bequest, but only 5% of those actually execute on those good intentions. Um, so our hope on our team is to bring awareness to gift planning to our donors and to help those who are philanthropically motivated to actually execute on those interests um, and do so in an easy, painless way, in a tax efficient way. Um, and it was wonderful to hear about Ms. Forrest's experience and that it was an easy and comfortable experience for her because that is our goal. Um, and our goal is to make sure um, our donors are aware of ways that these gifts can be mutually beneficial, not only to the university, but to themselves as well. Which brings me to my next point. Um, donors often think about giving cash um, when they think about giving to the charities that they care most about, but we wanna help our donors think broadly um, and more broadly than just direct cash giving. Um, and the majority of families have net worths that are made up of more than just cash, many assets such as stocks and bonds and retirement accounts. Um, and we like to help our donors to think about those broad ways that they can give, the tax benefits of those um, gifts that they can make and how transformative they can be here at UF. So if we continue to progress along, um, when we talk about gift planning here at UF, there are many different ways that a donor can make a gift at UF. 
um, through estate and gift, gift planning and many different assets that they can use. Um, so as we can see on the left side of the screen, these are some of the assets that we help donors um, when they consider making gifts here at UF, whether it's cash, securities, real estate, personal property, retirement accounts, bank, bank or brokerage accounts, life insurance policies, list goes on and on. And there's many, many different ways that donors can actually give those types of gifts. By far and away, the most common type as we I talked about prior is cash outright giving. Um, but really the most common type of gift that we encounter in my space, estate and gift planning is bequests. Um, we see a lot of bequests, but donors also give through charitable gift annuities, charitable remainder trust and charitable lead trust, retain life estates and qualified charitable distributions, AKA the IRA rollover. Um, and as Steve shared earlier during our time, we're gonna go over a few of these. Um, we do have time limitations, so we won't go over all of them. <laughs> If you all are ever interested in learning about a specific type of gift, um, I'm more than happy to talk with you all offline or um, please grab a hold of one of my colleagues on the, on the call. So as we move forward, the first type of gift vehicle that we're going to talk about are bequests. This is by far and away the most common type of gift that we encounter um, with our donors in the estate and gift planning space. Bequests can be made through a donor including UF in their will or trust or making UF the beneficiary of a life insurance policy or retirement account, a donor advised fund, a bank or brokerage account. Really, there's so many different ways. Um, and a donor can do this by actually naming us as the, a percentage beneficiary of an estate. They can name us as a beneficiary of a specific dollar amount, like $100,000 or $500,000, a specific piece of property, whether it's a piece of artwork or um, maybe a vacation home, or they can name us as the beneficiary of a residue of an estate. It's truly the donor's prerogative and what they feel most comfortable with. Um, and we, we do this in a very, um, hopefully a very easy and comfortable way for the donor. Um, and one of the ways that we try to do so is by providing bequest language, sample bequest language to the donor um, and to their estate attorney. Um, donors love this type of gift because it's revocable, meaning that the donor can maintain control of the asset until their death. In the event that something in their life changes, they need to make adjustments. Um, it's, it can be changed and adjusted if needed. Um, and the way that we document these gifts is a very simple process. Either we use a gift agreement or we have a notification form. It truly just depends on where the donor wants these resources to go on campus and how they want them to be used on campus. Um, but either way, neither one is legally binding. Um, and it's if you have an adjustment or change you need to make, you can just simply call myself or one of my team, team members um, on the estate and gift planning team or one of my team members here on the class team and let us know of an adjustment you need to make. Um, for those who have included UF in their estate plans and let us know about it, we want to celebrate you and celebrate you during your lifetime and celebrate your gift during your lifetime. Um, and so you'll become a member of our Legacy Society um, and be included on Legacy Society events. And obviously, everyone on this call will want to celebrate you um, if you do choose so and will want to do so in a way that you feel most comfortable with. A special note I do want to make, though, um, in regard to IRAs, the SECURE Act has actually eliminated the um, stretch IRA for non-spousal beneficiaries. Um, so this is now actually a very wise asset for donors who are considering naming UF as a beneficiary um, if they are wanting to do so through a bequest. Um, due to the heavy tax implications for children or other beneficiaries and them no longer being able to stretch those resources over a 10-year period, um, and UF being a 501c3 organization and not having to pay taxes, um, this might be an asset that one may want to consider if they're considering making um, a bequest. But speaking of IRAs, that will bring us to our next um, gift vehicle, which is the IRA rollover, AKA the Qualified Charitable Distribution. Um, these are synonymous terms. This type of gift does have an age association that's important to note. Um, the donor must be 70 and a half years of age or older to qualify for the IRA rollover. Those who are 72 and above may especially want to consider this due to the required minim minimum distribution, AKA the RMD that they will have to take. Um, if you are 72 and, and 72 and above, 
the transferred amount that you do make through a QCD can count towards your required minimum distribution. The beauty of this gift is that you can give up to $100,000 from your IRA directly to charity. As a result, the donor will not have to pay taxes on the money distributed to charity, meaning that the money is transferred directly from the IRA to the charity, completely bypassing the donor's taxable income. Again, this is a direct gift from your IRA to charity, completely bypassing you, um, which makes it very seamless. Um, as a result, this gift is a fan favorite because of its simplicity and ease and the tax advantages um, to the donor. This year, we hope to see an uptick in IRA rollovers because last year, due, the, due to the CARES Act, the RMD was eliminated or the required, the required portion of the RMD was eliminated. Um, and so we anticipate there to be an uptick in these types of gifts, um, especially because those who did forego the RMD may actually see an increase um, in their RMD this year. So if that's one of you all, please think of us. We're available. Um, but it is an important gift to consider a great way to make an immediate impact um, and a great way to make a bequest if one wanted to name you up as a beneficiary on such an account. So now that we talked about a gift that has an age limitation, I want to move on to a type of gift that has no age limitation, um, which brings us to appreciated securities. Um, this gift, again, has no age limitation. And as we've seen the market continue to grow and grow and grow this last year, year and a half, despite all of the craziness that the world has been through um, and still continues to go through, um, appreciated securities has become a more tax advantageous asset to consider giving um, to UF. Giving appreciated assets has multiple tax advantages. Um, a donor can avoid capital gains when gifting this type of asset, and a donor can also earn a charitable deduction. The charitable deduction, if not used the first year that it's earned, can actually be carried forward for an additional five years. Um, if one needs to do that. The great thing about these types of gifts is that they make an immediate impact on campus. If a donor is considering giving cash, we might um, encourage them to consider appreciated securities if they have them. Um, this gift will then as a result technically cost the donor less while making the same impact here on campus. Um, and in fact, recently I spoke to a donor who has an existing pledge um, and I talked to him about actually considering using appreciated securities to pay off the pledge rather than cash, um, because ultimately the impact here on campus will be the exact same, but it, the gift will cost less to the donor in the end due to the two tax advantages. But speaking of appreciated securities, this brings me to my next gift vehicle, which is life income gifts. So appreciated securities can actually be used in addition to cash to fund life income gifts. Um, and this is just a general flow chart of what a life income gift looks like. It's generally speaking when a donor gifts an asset, so either cash or appreciated securities, it's placed into the gift vehicle. In this instance, it's a charitable gift annuity. It could be a charitable remainder trust. During the lifetime of that gift vehicle, it will provide annual payments to the donor. Because the donor made a charitable gift, they will earn a charitable tax deduction. So the donor gets a charitable tax deduction for making the gift and they earn annual income for the rest of their life. Once they pass, whatever remains in that, in that gift vehicle will actually then go to the University of Florida. Um, so generally speaking, that's the flow chart. So we'll move on to our next slide. With the potential of interest rates being at zero for the near future, and some individuals um, could start considering using cash and appreciated securities to establish life income gifts. Um, as I shared previously, these gifts provide supplemental income, which can be compared to other investments such as CDs and bonds. Um, there are really two main types of life income gifts I want to highlight just very quickly, just for brevity purposes. I know we're running up against the clock. Um, the two are charitable gift annuities, CGAs, and charitable remainder trusts, CRTs. Um, they both have two concepts which are important to highlight. It's essentially gifting an asset um, and then it providing income for life. The way that these two gifts vary is that with a charitable gift annuity, um, this provides fixed income for life, meaning the annual payments will never change or fluctuate 
despite what the market does, it's a legally binding agreement between the donor and the university that the university will fulfill those pledge, those payments, those annual payments um, to the donor. The way that a charitable remainder trust varies um, is that it's actually a percentage payout most of the time, unless um, the way that the donor structures it is differently, but meaning that the actual annual payments can fluctuate depending on how the market performs. So it totally depends on what's best for the donor and what's best for their future and um, what they feel is the best thing that their financial and legal advisors recommend that they do. Which that provides us to the very last slide that I have, which wraps up our time here together. I flew through those. So I know that was a lot of information <laughs> all at once coming at you all. And I'm so grateful that you all included me on this time um, to go over the many wonderful ways that individuals from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences have made um, wonderful impacts, whether it's students, faculty members, or alum. Um, and so I'm grateful that you all have included me. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to myself or one of my team members, um, and we're happy to help. Thank you, Rachel. And again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. As Rachel said, if, if you have questions in follow up, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself, uh, reach out to Rachel, reach out to any of the folks who have been on this call. We'll be happy to help. And if you take nothing else away from today's call, I hope you will remember this. The lives and careers of our students are made better by the charitable gifts of our alumni and donors. And whether those gifts are made through annual funds and current dollars, or whether they're made through your estate plans, through a bequest, um, they make a truly transformational impact on our students. And our team is here to help facilitate your goals and help you to have the type of impact of your philanthropy that's gonna be best and most fulfilling for you. So thank you for everything you do for the University of Florida. Thank you for your support of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I hope you have a great week.